Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about how we can analyze batch reactor data in both gas phase and liquid phase reactions. But let's first talk about why we need to learn about interpreting batch reactor data. As we discussed in a previous video, a batch reactor is a closed system that allows no mass transfer into and out of the system once the reaction has begun. Therefore, batch reactors are excellent at allowing us to study the rate at which a given reaction occurs. So, let's imagine that we have this reaction. A plus B turns into C. But we are unsure how quickly this reaction occurs, which is important to know if we are going to be working with this reaction. Why do you think this is though? Well, what if we asked you to develop a reactor for the above reaction? You know it is a gas phase reaction, and you just build the simplest and cheapest reactor you can. Well, when it comes time for us to actually perform the reaction, we learn that it very quickly produces C and the pressure in our tank grows rapidly, and it explodes our tank. Well, this would be very bad, obviously. Of course this is a bit of a trivial example, but knowing the kinetics of our reaction is very important for safety, economics, reactor design, and environmental factors. So, how do we find the kinetics of our reaction if we don't know them? Well, this is where a batch reactor study is great. How we go about finding the kinetics depends on a few factors, such as if our reaction is occurring in the liquid or gas phase. Just know that we perform all the tests that we are going to talk about at a constant temperature, or said another way, isothermal temperatures. Then the experiment can be repeated at various temperatures to study how the reaction occurs at varying temperatures. For liquid phase reactions, we typically study some characteristic of our desired species, such as pH, conductivity, or something else. Whereas in gas phase reactions, with a change in the moles present, we can simply measure the pressure change. Otherwise, we have to perform more complex analysis methods. So, let's just imagine our earlier equation is now a liquid phase reaction. So we have A plus B produces C. After tracking the changes in our liquid over time, we will get some data that looks like this. Then we need to convert this data into conversion. If you are unsure what reaction conversion is, there will be a link in the description below for you to review. For liquid reactions and gas phase reactions with no molar change between the product and reactant, we can express the conversion using the limiting reagent and the following equation. So we have that the initial concentration of component A minus the current concentration of component A divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of our component A over the stoichiometric coefficient of our limiting reagent times the initial concentration of our limiting reagent. If we are dealing with a gas phase reaction with difference in moles between the reactants and product side, we can use two ideal gas law equations. The top one is our ideal gas law at some specific point in time, and our bottom ideal gas law is for our initial reactor conditions. So, we need to solve this equation for conversion much like we previously did for liquid and gas phase reactions with zero mole changes. So we can cancel out the gas constant as it is well a constant. Also, we can cancel the volume terms as we are working in a batch reactor and the volume of the system is fixed to the size of our batch reactor. Then we multiply by the initial pressure. Then we can use the following equation for the total number of moles in our system at a given time. This term here describes the mole change when we have one step forward in our reaction. So it is the sum of every stoichiometric coefficient in our reaction divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of our limiting reagent. Now after the substitution, we can substitute the moles of our initial limiting reagent over the total moles of our system, as our initial limiting reagent mole fraction like so. Now we just need to rearrange conversion, and there we go. So now that we can convert all of our batch reactor data into time versus conversion, now we just need to use one of the following methods, either integral or differential method, to complete finding our kinetics. However, this step is quite a bit more involved, and we will talk about both these methods, the integral method and the differential method, in their own videos, which I will link below in the description. Thank you for checking out this video, and I hope it helped your fundamental understanding of why we need to find the kinetics of reaction and how we begin to stall for them. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe, and consider checking out our Patreon page to support the channel. 
However, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns about the information I provided in this video, please leave a comment down below and I will do my best to address your concerns.